My name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign, where we are joining Jeb and Bill in the soy juice capsule, where... Bill, really? Come on, man. Pull yourself together. It isn't that bad. As I was saying, uh, Bill and Jeb here, along with Carol, who is in the other capsule, are in low polar orbit about the moon, and they're here to collect EVA uh, scans... Known scans, sure. EVA reports, sorry, that's the word I'm looking for, over all the different biomes that are in the moon. And we put them out there last episode, as you might recall. And in this episode, we're going to be getting them back. But they still have a few more biomes to collect EVA reports over still to go. And uh, that's not going to be happening for a while yet. It's going to take a while for the moon to rotate enough to get us over the biomes that we want. So in the meantime, we're going to move over to uh, JunkSat 5 here. Here we have a contract to put JunkSat 5 into this uh, inclined orbit. Not too bad. Only an inclination of 11.8 degrees and about, I don't know, probably about a semi-major axis of around 35 hundred kilometers we got to get it into this orbit to finish off this contract and then there's a secondary part to the mission i'm going to shuffle it off to minmis where it will hopefully continue to work as a communications satellite to help fulfill another communication remote tech contract that i have so i'm going to do the the thing i normally do with launching into an inclined orbit i'm going to uh, make sure my launch site is right below the ascending or the descending node you can see here i'm pretty close as it is so why don't we get this show on the road now i'm going to preface this ascent by letting you know that i've been uh playing around with my launch script one of the reasons being i don't like this shimmy that you see it just do right there at the, at the launch pad. And that has to do with actually, I, I, I got into rotating the craft so that uh, in the vehicle assembly building, and it seems to want to go to its original orientation and then go into the orientation that I want. So that's what's causing the shimmy. So I'm gonna stop doing that. But I also started playing with the script because uh, I had issues with it launching into retrograde orbits. It would get very, very confused as to which way the rocket should point. And I solved that. Um, i got to get a contract that gets me going to a retrograde orbit so that I can show you that. So I was very happy with it. Um, however, I will point out that this particular script that I'm running right here is sort of an intermediate step. I hadn't worked out all the bugs yet. And one of the things that started to happen is I started to get this kind of this oscillating happening um, that didn't happen with this particular rocket during its initial testing. Um... I gotta be honest, I don't think that's entirely the fault of the script. I think it's also the fact that my payload perhaps isn't as secure as it should be. But as these oscillations started getting worse and worse, I started to think, you know, I, I best be on the ball here. Okay, yeah, I don't like this. You can see on the nav ball there how you're getting right to the edge of the, of the prograde vector. If it veers off of that, just rotating round and round. I think the... Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh, get back, get back, get back. No, it's not getting back. I'm losing it, I'm losing it. Let's get this engine shut off here. Just thrust to zero. Boom, that's it. Okay, and control C will cancel the KOS script. So there, that's canceled now. Now I'm just going to take it over manually. So I need to get back onto that prograde vector. Oh, that is the retrograde vector. <laughs> We're going the wrong direction. Come on, get back. Thankfully, the air is pretty thin here. So I want to get back onto the prograde vector here. It should be coming. There it is. Let's uh, fire that and get that thrust back up and start firing that engine again. All right, go, 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 go. Woohoo! There we go. Nothing like a somersault in the middle of your ascent. <laughs> Okay, so let's recover this thing. So I need to keep thrusting until my apoapsis gets up around 80 kilometers. I can see my inclination is rather messed up. It's almost 16 degrees, so it's way too high. It's supposed to be 11.8 degrees, but I'm not going to worry about that. I, I can at least save the first part of this mission because there's quite a lot of fuel. Um, because I, remember, I want to get this thing to Minmus, so it actually has quite a lot of extra delta V so that I can get it to Minmus. So at the very least, I can, should be able to still do this orbital insertion part of the contract. And here as the fairings come off, we can start to see the problem. Or at least what I think the problem is. And that has to do with this joint right in here. It's just too flimsy. I think it got wobbly in there. 
inside the fairing, and that's what caused that that oscillation that you were seeing. I need to shore that up with some struts, which I'll make sure to do the next time I launch a payload that's kind of long and heavy like this guy is. But as it turned out, that turned out to be just the beginning of my challenges with this particular mission because once I completed my circularization into low carbon orbit and went out to map view, yeah, I, I, I burned the wrong way. <laughs> uh, my, my inclination is in the wrong direction. I burned towards the north when I should have been burning towards the south, 11.8 degrees. So, and because my inclination is actually messed up, this is gonna necessitate uh, about a uh, 20, almost 28 degree inclination change I'm gonna to need to do. But I'm gonna to have to worry about that later. I don't wanna make the inclination change now. What I wanna do is get myself out to the correct altitude first. So I'm gonna set up my transfer burn and the right place to do this is at either the ascending or the descending node and aim for, as you can see here, I'm actually aiming for the uh, the ascending node of my other orbit there. And uh, I'm just gonna have to eyeball this because I don't have an altitude for that ascending node. Uh, move that time in bright and bring it down a little bit, oh, up a little bit there. Yeah, and while I'm doing this, um, the reason why I don't want to do the inclination change now is because, remember, inclination changes in low orbit are expensive. The further you are out from the parent body, the uh, less these normal burns are going to cost you. So I want to do the normal burn out there, out there at my apoapsis, not uh, near the body. In fact, if I did the inclination change right now, it would cost me over a thousand meters per second, and you're gonna see very quickly, it's gonna cost me a lot less out there. And as we're completing this transfer burn, you might recall that quite a number of episodes ago, I actually had a situation that wasn't too dissimilar from this, uh, where I had to insert a satellite into an orbit and make an inclination change, though that one happened for an entirely different reason, but I, and I won't go into those reasons right now. Um, but back then what I did is I actually went out there and then circularized or inserted myself into the orbit and then changed my inclination. And that cost me quite a lot of time, but it also wasn't the most efficient way to do it. And I'm looking at this now, I don't know why I did it this way. The better way to do it is to actually combine your inclination change and your orbital insertion into a single burn. So I'm gonna set up a maneuver node out here at Apoapsis, and this maneuver node's gonna have a bit of everything. It's gonna have some prograde to get my altitude of my orbit up to where it needs to be, the semi-major axis where it needs to be. It's gonna have some normal, of course, to make the inclination change, and it's going to have a little bit of radial because I do have to move the periapsis and the apoapsis around a bit to get the argument of the periapsis right. And this bird ended up costing me about, its you can see it here, it's about 552 meters per second. Not bad. But if I had done it separately, in other words, did the orbital insertion part and then did the um, inclination change separately, that would have cost me a total of 870 meters per second. So again, combine burns together. If you can, that saves you uh, quite a bit of fuel. Anyway, that burn's not going to happen for about another hour and 20 minutes. So that gives us some time to pop over to the Corian, which is in orbit about the moon and uh, where they're gonna, they're getting ready to pick up another EVA. This one over the moon's east crater, which of course we're going to immediately transmit back to the KSC so that we can hopefully make some use of it. And that leaves us with only two biomes left to get, the uh, northern basin here and then the southwest crater down here. And it's gonna be a little bit of time before uh, the Karayim finds itself over either of those two, so that gives us time to get back out to JunkSat 5 to complete its orbital insertion. And that insertion went perfectly fine without incident. Just got to wait for the contract to go green. There we go. So there we go. The first part of the mission is done. And I still have 1,091 meters per second left in this vehicle. And oh, it looks like the plane of my orbit is not really that different from the plane of Minmus's orbit. That is really fortunate and really is going to help me make this burn out to Minmus quite a bit cheaper. And in fact, 
After setting it all up, it turned out that that transfer out to Minmus only cost me about 317 meters per second for the transfer burn, plus an additional 30 meter per second correction burn out, uh, but you know, at the halfway point, approximately on its way out to Minmus. But the first of those burns isn't going to happen for another day, so that gives us some time to join Bartner and Zelfi, who we left last episode in low carbon orbit. Yes, there's never a shortage of going ons here. Last episode, these two were sent into low carbon orbit to fulfill a tourist contract. That was really all it was about. But uh, I thought I'd send them at the same time over to Duna 1 to fix a battery while it waits for its transfer window out to Duna. But while I was in the process of doing that, well, we got distracted and we ended up visiting Gelfi, who is in Kerbin Station, also in orbit around Kerbin. And while we were there, you might recall, well, we played a little bit with explosives, didn't we? <laughs> so that was a fun diversion, but now it's back to get to, back to getting to, sorry, I can get this out, getting to Duna 1. So we're going to perform our transfer to meet up and rendezvous with Duna 1. Once at Duna 1, although the battery was a little bit hidden under all of these solar panels, uh, Bartner was able to find it and get in there and fix up that battery and get it good as new. And then it was just a simple matter of uh, doing the descent to finally finish off that tourist contract, which we started oh so long ago. <laughs> Sometimes the simplest things end up taking a bit of a wanderous journey. And then we join the Karayan in orbit about the moon, having already collected it's EVA over the northern basin and what we are doing here you can see on the left there I have an expanded map showing the southwest crater our last biome and I'm just hoping that we can just catch the edge of it and yes all right there we go so that finishes off all of these EVA reports now it's time to uh, well we're going to transmit that of course but then comes time to uh plan our getaway and get these guys back home. Now, because this is a polar orbit, it's a little bit more complicated. I actually shouldn't be trying to get out of here until the plane of my orbit around the moon is in line with, is parallel to the moon's orbit around Kerbin. But instead of guessing at when that's going to happen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a maneuver node here, as you can see, and give me some escape velocity. And then what I'm going to do is use the plus orbit button that comes with precise node to move myself forward in time. And you can see as I do this, you can see my orbit, my resulting orbit after escaping from the moon is changing. And what I want to do is I want to keep track of my periapsis. And when my periapsis gets to its lowest, that's when I know I'm close to being in the right place. And you can see my apoapsis is actually moving along, and that's because that's where the moon is going to be when I perform this burn. And then after you've got the periapsis as low as you can get it just by the timing of the burn, then it's time to just sort of play with the amount of prograde that you give, get that apoap or periapsis, I'm sorry, down into the atmosphere. There, that's about 50 kilometers. I think I'm probably going to go with that. However, this burn's not going to be for another day or so, so we'll leave these folks uh, orbiting about the moon because right now we need to get ourselves to junk sat 5 get its transfer burn to minmis out of the way that's what pretty much always happens when you leave a vessel uh, with a maneuver note is that KSP no longer gives you the estimated burn so what I just did there is I just gave myself a quick puff so I can get the burn estimate back and I can see here the estimated burn now is 12 seconds so we'll just, you know, about split that difference for the start of our burn. We'll do this from Min Miss's view. There we go. Let's burn. I always actually go a little bit more than half when I split the difference because always towards the end of the burn, you know, I'll, I won't be going full throttle. So I always end up reducing thrust at the end. So it always takes me a little more than what the estimate is going to be. And, uh... I'm not going to see my path through Minmus because there's a correction burn. So the only thing I can do is just burn this down to zero. Or pretty close to, oh, it's starting to go back up. So that's it, burn done. And then we can take a look at what our projected path is after the correction burn. 
and you can see here it's it's not I want to get into that same orbit as the satellite that's already around Minmus so that's just going to take a little bit of tweaking on my correction burn but you know that's not going to be coming for another couple of days so it's time to leave this guy and uh, get ourselves back to the Kerbal Space Center where I found another contract waiting for me yeah it's it's kind of weird I I do have the um administrative building fully upgraded but uh, which says you can have you know unlimited number of contracts but it really seems to max you out at about 11. Once you get 11 contracts it doesn't seem to want to give you any more and new ones don't spawn until you finished off old ones and I just finished off a transmit science from around the moon contract so that's why another one's just popped up here and I don't like this uh, ferry tourist. I don't want to do any more of these tourist contracts so I'm going to decline this one Okay, test the thud. Uh, I landed on Kerbin. Seems easy enough, but no, I don't want to do that. Uh, rescue Louis Kerman. Ooh, another Kerbal Rescue. Well, I kind of like this one, but I only want to do it if she is in low orbit around Kerbin. I don't want to go into some big high orbit and make this into a major mission. So I'm going to accept it, and then I'm just going to check what her orbit is in the tracking station. You can always decline the contract afterwards, and all you lose is whatever money they advanced you. So there's no risk in doing this. And you can see here, she is in a low orbit around Kerbin, and quite frankly, I think Lafia needs something to do. So we made sure that the curse dock, or one of the curse docks, there's two of them attached to this station, but one of them is fully fueled and ready to go, and then Glafia is going to be using her engineering prowess to disconnect this fuel pipe, and then get on aboard. To be honest, I could have actually done the mission without Glafia at all, because this curse dock does have a probe core on it, it can fly on its own, I could have grabbed Lula and just come back, but... I don't know. Lafia needs to stretch her legs, I think. And then once aboard, and once we had Luya selected as a target, I could see that the intercept angle with her was just over six degrees and climbing. So I'm just past the ideal place in which to do my rendezvous burn, but I decided I'm just going to go for it anyway because uh, it would be a long time to have to wait uh, before these two ships were in alignment once again. Everything about this rendezvous was going pretty routinely. I mean, I did get this message about Luya having absolutely no life support. Uh, that's just something. They get spawned with no life support in Kerbal Space Program. And uh, earlier on in the series, I was editing to uh, give them life support. But then I realized, you know what? They have plenty of time to 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 perform the rendezvous and without that being a worry. So I, I don't worry about it anymore. Okay, so there we go. Got us down to 15 meters per second relative velocity in just a clock. Oh, electric charge is running out on the curse dock. Yeah, that's an inherent problem with the curse docks that I should have addressed a long time ago. They don't have any batteries on them. The only, the only batteries they have is in the command capsule and then that probe core, which is not too much. So I am almost for sure... I'm not getting any electricity, so there's no sunlight, so that's not going to work. Um, I'm almost for sure going to run out of electrical power before I get to Luya, and that means that I will have no attitude control. So, oh, electric, okay, I have no more attitude control. Let's get my relative velocity down as low as I can. Uh, 1.3, 1.3 meters per second relative velocity I just lost. I can't adjust to the retrograde vector to reduce it any further. I'm still well over half a kilometer away, but, well, you know, you know, Mark Watt, he got across with, uh, in the Martian with a relative velocity of about five meters per second, so yeah, so you could do this, so let's get her over there, because I don't want to wait any longer, because she is running out of life support, so let's EVA Luya and get her over there. Okay, so, we'll just, uh, Get on over it. it's what 600 meters we can do 600 meters that's not a problem and in fact it did go without any problems whatsoever except uh the i did get this annoying repetitive message from uh, the remote tech flight computer this happened a number of episodes ago as well in much the same situation yeah the flight computer freaks out when it doesn't have any electricity so well that's what that is but lula got aboard without any issues and then we're aboard here, and yeah, we're, we're past approaching Luya's craft, and now moving away from Luya's craft, but uh, oh well, at least we're not going to run into it. 
and now it's just waiting for the sun to come up and there we go so with electrical power once again I have attitude control because now my reaction wheels are working and you know I'm just over a kilometer away from Louis craft so uh, Sophia has another idea on how to deal with it so we're gonna close the distance between us and Louis craft or not get ourselves that close and in the past I've just been deleting these crafts from these rescued kerbals just from the tracking station, which I don't particularly like doing, but uh, I can't handle debris. But now, well, we have these fun explosives that we were playing with last time, and Glafia was watching uh, Rodbart kind of have some fun with it. So I think now it's her turn. So uh, she'll just make her way on over there. And you know, once over there, I once again had issues with getting the explosives to stick to the vessel. Now, last time I did this with an escape tower, so I thought, oh, maybe it just has to do with the escape tower. But, you know, this is the one-man lander can, and it clearly has attachment points on both the top and the bottom, but they don't seem to work. And I don't know if I'm doing something wrong or what the deal is, but again, I just decided I'd lay this alongside it. Okay. Well, let's check out this setup menu. There that I, uh, last time I never looked at this. Okay, so you can set the amount of the timer. You can set the size of the explosion, so it's a 10 meter radius, so I assume if you're within 10 meters, oh. Oh wait, she has one in her hand too. Oh, I don't want to end up, let's <laughs> unequip that. I don't want to activate and end up having both of those go off while she's hanging on to one. That would be not a good thing. I wonder if her having one in her hand is, well, no time for that now. Let's activate and get the heck out of here. Yeah, I was wondering if maybe having one in her hand was the problem why I couldn't attach the other one. Oh, and there we go. This time I know I was ready for it. Great, no more debris. I've only got two more explosives left. I'm going to definitely need to get more up here, but uh, that's going to have to be for another time. And in fact, once I got the FIA back aboard the Kerstock, um... Turned out that my rendezvous burn to get back to the Kerbin station was going to be a little bit more than a day away. So I've got Glafia and Luya here in low Kerbin orbit. I've got uh, Jeb and Bill and Carol in low Mooner orbit getting ready to come back to the station as well. So these five Kerbinauts all have to make their way back to the Kerbin station. But I think that's going to have to be for the next episode. I thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time.